Okay. Okay. Today is September the 24th, 2012, and we are in Austin, Texas, interviewing the one and only Dennis Patty um, about the Gay Liberation Front, of which he was a part, and he's going to tell us the history. And I'm Grace McAvoy. So we were discussing. Your name is? Dennis Patty, and no middle name. My father was too young when I was born and by the same to, you know, sign the birth certificate. And he was supposed to put Dennis Clayton Patty, but he put just Dennis Patty because he was embarrassed, I guess. <laughs> anyway, yeah, no, no middle name. No middle name. Okay. Um, well, we want to talk about um, the genesis of the Gay Liberation Front and your involvement in that. Okay. You may start wherever you like. Okay, well, first of all, I need to, I have gotten it straight in my head, the dates. Uh, <clears throat> Gay Liberation in Austin actually started with a group of friends before any or, a, a political organization or um, anything like that. In 68, we moved into an old house at 105 Natchez, and um, from that grew a sort of a co-op commune. And then in the summer of 69, um, Stonewall happened. And then it was 70, the spring of 70 before Gay Liberation. April of 70, Jim Denny, Margaret McNeil, and I, and a guy named Neil Parker, and some others that, whose names I can't remember, met at Sutton Hall at the University of Texas campus. Uh, and that was the first given day of the meeting. Then we moved to the Union, and shortly thereafter, I think probably sometime in the fall, they kicked us off campus because they couldn't, they didn't want any gay liberation on campus. So we moved over to the University of Y, which is across the, uh, the across the drag. And the University of Y, the Methodist Student Center, and the Chug Wagon in the Student Union at UT were the centers of all the activity of just of the anti-war movement, the women's movement. That was where all the conversations and meetings and everything took place. And our um, uh, the effort was of the group at large was to get the group back on campus. But I was not particularly interested in that. We had a place to meet, and I was more concerned with the larger pol politics. Gay Liberation Front means an alliance with the uh, North Vietnamese and the uh, Viet Cong. We saw ourselves as the, you know, the front of liberation uh, as they were fighting the American Empire, so were we. That eventu eventuated, of course, in the problem, a very strong public relations problem, because it, it became apparent that the people fighting for the empire in, in South Vietnam were American boys. And so uh, that was a sticking point with, with the whole thing. But the, uh, the, the genesis was <clears throat> a severe alienation that uh, was manipulated by the leftist perspective and the that phase only lasted for I would say a year two years and after that the, the got the, we got back on campus and the focus became civil rights gay rights gay civil rights and also then a, a younger crew had come along and the, the younger people, as they always seem to be, were interested in sort of knocking us off our pedestals. And it was fine with me, because I had had enough of uh, uh, meetings. <laughs> I forgot the one that I hated, meetings. And, but the, 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 the women's movement, the civil rights movement, uh, the university campus just, was just full of Marxist study groups. And so that all blended together in the, it was sort of a Duke's mixture actually, I'm not sure how well thought out the, uh, the analysis was, 
uh, the, there was a, a kind of uh, fashion, I guess, that went along with all that since everybody in the country was up in arms about the illegal war, the first <coughs> imperial aggressive war in our generation, of course. And so uh, the, the philosophical underpinnings were uh, political in those senses, but the, I think it took another 10 years to really sort of sort out what it was, what was that we were about. Uh, there's a lot of uh, highly charged uh, uh, feeling that went into the, the creation of, the, of those first years. Uh, and also, uh, I have never really been a professional activist. These things sort of came out of my social life, the, the, the political stuff that I did. However, there's another uh, aspect to it that, uh, that often goes unmentioned. There was a social uh, synthesis in Austin, a gay social synthesis, for a long time before uh, the political uh, movement came along. I would say probably, someone asked me the other day why I thought Austin was so wide open and had it always been, and I said, well, I think it has, the Cowboys, you know. It was a, it was a, a town to come in and shoot them up and, you know, uh, get your uh, uh, jollies off and all that. And then the, uh, in the middle of the 19th century, you know, there were uh, revolutions in Europe. They called the revolutions of 1848, and they took the ideals of the French Revolution all across uh, Western Europe into Germany, and that was the uh, that was how Elizabeth Ney and those Germans, uh, German intellectuals and artists and politicians and everything all got here because they had to leave Germany and they came here. And then the landscape, it was so beautiful. The, uh, it was like uh, there was a uh, Greco-Latinate tone, and the city was so small. It was uh, uh, largely built out of stone, hand-built, it was beautiful, it was absolutely a beautiful little 19th century capital city. And then of course the, the, uh, the military bases and uh, the university uh, you know, added to the, that, that, the sort of gene pool of it all. So there's always, there was always a gay scene. Someone was telling me uh, uh, that his uncle had, this is man my age, had been gay and he lived in Louisiana or someplace like that. And he came here to school and he described arriving in Austin as arriving in heaven because of that. And then the first time that I ever heard of it, the of Austin as that, uh, a guy from Hope, I'm from Hope, Arkansas, born and raised there, and uh, he got caught with the football team. And, uh, you know, there's from a very wealthy family, one of the wealthiest in Arkansas. And so they had to have place, some place to send him. And so they sent him to here to Texas, I mean to Austin, and this friend of mine whose uh, husband had gone to UT and his daughter had gone to SMU said, well, that's like throwing Br'er Rabbit into the Briar Patch <laughs> sitting down there because they knew that there was a gay uh, scene here. Mm -hmm. And when I first uh, 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 came out, as it were, I never really do use that word a lot, but that's convenient, uh, I met a lot of old southern gay men who could tell stories just, you know, to all night long, and th there was sort of a mythic phase then. After World War II, the, uh, the social scene just exploded here, apparently, the gay social scene. And there was a party up in Waco, and they were all in drag and big hoop skirts and everything, and got busted. And they went over the back fence, the ones that could, and the, but it was a big scandal, and people were you know, exposed, fa prominent families and all that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, the university, of course, uh, provided a a scene, and there was always a gay scene there, and there would be purges. This guy, Howard Hand, this antique theater used to tell these stories, called them plages. The plage of 35 or the plage of 40, and uh, the, one, my, one of my favorite stories out of that is this guy, his mother had a boarding house, and it was a gay boarding house, and she didn't know everybody was gay. Her son was gay, too. She, I guess she suspected they were, there weren't any girls around, apparently, but Anyway, they got, <clears throat> there was a purge, and uh, he got kicked out of the university. He came home to tell his mother, and she always kept a big, huge pot of soup on the stove, and she was listening to it, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> clanging, clanging the, sp the spoon on the soup, you know, as he got louder and louder as he told her more details. And finally she said, well, you know, we've got to get you out of town. There's no, you know, you're not going to jail. And so 
she, you know, got all of her scrimp uh, savings and bought him a ticket to Paris. And he arrived in Paris with, you know, the clothes on his back and was sitting in the Bois de Boulogne. And this old man sat down beside him and he happened to be, this guy studied music, and he happened to be a, on the faculty at the Paris Conservatory. And they, you know, fell in love. And he, you know, further, he finished his education there. And eventually he came back here. So there's always been that kind of, uh, you know, uh, of, uh, story that goes with the, the, the with Austin, and then the um, the, the when, when I the, in '68, the the it just became clear in the political nexus that there were gay people in that were involved, you know, and we were not, we were out, we weren't, you know, but there was no organization around it. And then we moved into that house down at 105 Natchez, summer of 69, we were still, you know, psycho, psychologized. I mean, we saw ourselves as uh, <clears throat> damaged people, sick people, I think, even. And uh, so uh, we were reading of this, uh, psychologist named R.D. Lang, who basically said, well, you know, they're, they're, the modern, modern psychological therapy mixes two categories, uh, experiential and uh, uh, drug therapy. And you can't, there, you can't make uh, a diagnosis for use of drugs in relation to this experiential process. And what has to happen if you're going to get anywhere in this in the process of reducing neurosis and uh, addressing the reality of psychosis is that the person has to live out the psychosis, live through the uh, the trauma or whatever. And so we thought, well, that sounds like a pretty good idea. If we're homosexuals, that means we have to live out being homosexuals. And then uh, Walt Whitman. I mean, you know, you can't read Walt Whitman and not realize oh, God, that's what he's talking about. You know, he's talking about love of one man for another, a sexual uh, love. And then I think a friend of mine was asked to give a lecture at the Unitarian Church, and he quoted me. They asked him what um, was the biggest factor in gay liberation, in his, in, in his opinion, and I, in my opinion. And I said, well, LSD. Uh, the, the LSD therapy, which is how we used it, we weren't tripping in the bars on, on drugs, you were doing it in a very different context, just tell, made it very clear there's nothing wrong, there's not really anything wrong with us, you know? And uh, my, I had had, I'd gone to India and had a just disastrous experience there. When I came back, my family insisted that I go into therapy, which I did, and I went and I, the first time, and I, you know, just jammed him and told him all this stuff, you know, oh, blah, 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 like that, and then he listens, very heavy set, guy with a pipe. And uh, second time I went, I walked in and he said, I started up, you know, oh, just, you know, <laughs> expatiating on my misery. And he said, uh, you're good looking, you're smart, there's not anything that you can't ha do or have in life. I'm letting you off the hook, pay the, uh, the secretary $25. So from that, uh, and I was really, uh, I have to say, you know, I, I was everywhere in, the, in those days in the, uh, in the movement thinking about all this and, was, and, and writing, because I, I, I intended to be a writer uh, from, the, from uh, day one, actually. So uh, it was the artistic, and there's another, oh, and another, uh, that's the social uh, aspect, but then there's the artistic. Uh, you have to remember that the Fantastics comes out of Austin. I don't know whether Jones or Schmidt are gay, but that play, The Fantastics, is, <laughs> is gay. Mm -hmm. And uh, then um, uh, there, there was a, a group, there was a place called The Compound. It was over on 15th Street, as I recall, uh, I think it's under the archive, the state archive over there now. But, and all the drama students lived there. In, the, in this place. And it was like going to, uh, you know, a surrealist play <laughs> to go over there. But they were literally flying around, you know, uh, the place and performing, constantly performing. And the guy that uh, was the head honcho was a guy named Doug Dyer, a genius 
of the American theater, if there ever was one, unheralded and tragic. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, if he, if it had, uh, you know, like there's the old song, if it wasn't for whiskey, the Irish would rule the world, and if it hadn't been for cocaine, Doug would have ruled the theater. I mean, cocaine is really what he would do. And he uh, um, staged a play called Now the Revolution, which was taken to New York and became stomped there and went to Europe and well, they went through all these adventures and everything. Uh, but uh, Doug's presence and his talent and influence um, brought forth the idea of life as performance because he was involved with uh, Jerzy Grotowski, the Polish Theater Lab uh, genius. And uh, he, the method that he used for uh, the direction of creation of Stomp was taking a bunch of University of Texas kids and having them tell their life stories. Well, he took that then to the public theater in New York and was rehearsing up there, and uh, the guy that did uh, the chorus line, Michael Bennett, was in the you know, mix there. He saw this and he thought, oh, well, I can do that with a bunch of uh, you know, chorus boys and girls, which he did. So there was the, you know, there was always, uh, who else? Uh, well, B. Iden Payne, you know, the great director over there, he came here from England and he was big. And one of the great, uh, the, the, the most pr prominent uh, scholars of Lord Byron was on the faculty, Willis Pratt was on the faculty there. And uh, there was a guy named Tom Nichols, and he was a wild child, he was 12 years old, acting in all these plays and being, being a bad boy. And so the, there was just a, you know, there was a nexus, even though some of it was negative, you know, that these experiences that people had being busted and purged and everything, were ne nonetheless, it was talked about. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was, when I first came here, there was a very active uh, social scene that it was sort of like the old South, you know, it had to be introduced and carried around and everything. And my group, my age group, didn't want to do all that. And what year was that? I first came to Austin in 65. So that would have been probably 67 uh, when I came, I came back here to school. I came back to school in the fall of 65 and then I went, I was gone for a couple of years and came back. And that's when I really started living here. And uh, the, it got involved with the anti-war movement. Oh, okay. I would say that the anti-war movement is the genesis of the gay liberation. Heavily influenced by the feminists. Uh, and then the, you know, the civil, the, at the same time, of course, in East Austin, they were, you know, the, they had started uh, uh, breakfast programs for preschoolers, and, you know, there was a lot of uh, organizational uh, activity in the, amongst the uh, blacks and uh, Hispanics. And so that all, and we were just sort of assimilated into the, into this, uh, hodgepodge of organizations, and the the there was a an allegiance. To, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> there was an allegiance to uh, to these political uh, movements that, in a way, superseded the the gay thing until later. I really didn't see this. Well, I I did, but I saw it in a different uh, context. I didn't see the significance. Of uh, the, the gay uh, organization, except as an adjunct to these other uh, causes and everything. There were other people who were much more far-sighted than I, uh, and believed that we were doing something significant. You know that would eventually turn into what it's turned into. I just never thought that the country would object so heavily to gay rights. You know that there would be such that would elect uh, George Bush twice. You know I, the uh, when. Carl Rove, you know, when he when he's running for governor, he put uh, anti-gay libera gay uh, literature on every car and every parking lot and every church in Texas yeah. one Sunday morning, but just on Tuesday before the election. And so the, uh, but <clears throat> as it turns out, when you you study gay history and uh, the influence of homosexuals and homosexuality in Western culture then it becomes 
inevitable, I think, that something like a daily ration fund uh, will appear. Uh, do you want me to talk some about where I think it is now, or do uh, you um, have questions? Oh, okay. Well, um, I do want to know about the gay, uh, the first conference. Here. Oh, okay. And um, <laughs> the organization of it. I understand what it was, and you can tell us something about that. Okay. Well, the that f uh, first meeting happened in April of '70, and the the. In the between, and this was the gay liberation front. front. Is the that first what meeting. Is? No, this is the front I'm talking about. The first, okay. the first meeting of the gay liberation front happened in April. By uh, November, December, it was clear that we were not going to uh, kowtow to California and New York in relation to how what, how we were going to proceed. They weren't going to come here and organize us and tell us we had already done all that. Or in our in our view, we had. And so to <clears throat> sort of <clears throat> get the scoop on everything, Jim Denny, who is the hero of my novel, asked the fire to get a plug in there, uh, okay. this came up with the idea that we should just have a conference. We had this little town, it was beautiful. There were churches and other organizations, people all over town that would help us. And uh, so we sent a letter out. Uh, there was a... Uh, a Again, I can't remember the uh, uh, the exact uh, sequence of times, but there was a, a publication called Gay Sunshine, and it was put out by a collective in San Francisco, and it would arrive sort of like a missive from the great beyond, you know, and uh, uh, and so we were advertised it in that, and just organ just you know, just had a conference, and they. Uh, the w the idea that we had, of course, was very different from how it turned out because the people from New York and California had already moved into a feminist analysis of the gay position in history and uh, and the nature of gay oppression in relation to uh, uh, other uh, oppressions, and we were t we were. We were very concerned that we weren't hicks, weren't seen as hicks, but when they got here we realized, well, we are. Like I said before, <laughs> we are, we're, we're back, we're behind this. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, that turned into a struggle because the, there was a kind of uh, commissariat attitude. I mean, they were going to tell us how to organize and how to do, and it just didn't go down. So there was, from the very beginning, there was a, uh, uh, a contention uh, in, in all that, but it it was organized around the principle of consciousness raising and workshops. So there were all these workshops. Uh, you could, you know, uh, uh, Madame Nu. You know who Madame Nu was? The, yeah. She was the uh, she was the negotiator at the Paris Peace Conference for the Viet Cong, and she was a hero to the uh, movement. So there were, you know. Uh, consciousness raising groups in relation to those kinds of things and uh, the you know farm uh, farm workers and La Raza and all of these uh, things that we were, we were a part of but the overall the, 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 the drag queen stole the show because we had never seen anything like the uh, like what came you know bawling out of uh, New York and San Francisco at us and they were very concerned because we we really lived. I mean, Austin was considered, it was called the Palm Springs of the movement. And they were always chiding us for not being, uh, you know, challenged enough in terms of the revolution, you know, to really uh, uh, radicalize ourselves and everything. And uh, <coughs> so that <coughs> that was an irritant. But in the uh, in the long haul, it was very successful. I mean, the, uh, the, and this is something that needs to be re realized now. So, so the same thing has happened in the, in the groups now. There are all these different contending groups, and they identify themselves as leather folk or, you know, leather women or whatever. And uh, they've lost sight of the fact that they're just, they're just gay human beings, you know, that all this 
fetishism and their particular uh, uh, all that was there in the in the very beginning, you know. And the arguments that ever, that are happening right now were there in germs, some fully fully fledged uh, in those days. But the the nature of gender, the nature of uh, love, the, you know, what is the responsibility of uh, society society to uh, same sex uh, feeling? All of those things were part of the workshops and the part of that uh, nexus that, uh, that was addressed. <clears throat> were there workshops on civil disobedience and well, activism? That's, that, I think that's the, uh, that when I was talking about the Palm Springs of the movement, that's sort of what they meant. Because we, we didn't have to worry about much. I mean, the, uh, there was not that kind of crackdown on us here that there was in Los Angeles and even San Francisco. The, the uh, the the city when the conference uh, came, the churches and civic groups and everything helped us put these people up. You know they had places to sleep and they helped us feed them and everything. So the uh, and Austin has always been a live and let live little you know part of the world. And the it's interesting. Uh, I saw a theo I worked for a rare map dealer for a while and I saw a theological map of Texas and it had you know Baptist counties, pink, Methodist, blue, Presbyterian, white, or whatever, and the, there's one in the center that was green, and there's only, there only one green one, and the de denomination was atheist, <laughs> and that was Austin, that was Travis County. So, the, uh, it, the, there were civil disobedience, uh, but see, we had all gone through that in relation to the anti-war movement, uh, and the, the Truthfully, there weren't many radicals in the early gay liberation. The, 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 another bifurcation that happened very early was the, uh, uh, the conflict between bourgeois uh, values and people who held those and people who wanted to. I, for instance, you know, believed that we were on the verge of the New Jerusalem. You know, I, was, I was involved in the first food co-ops. I was involved in the anti-nuke movement. I was involved in the Barton Spring stuff, all of that stuff. For years and years and years, environmentalism and environmentalism and various uh, causes, but it took a, it took those of us who were in that process a long time to realize that everything was going to revert to America as it was, that we were only a blip on the screen, you know, that we might, we might be able to change cultural norms and cultural values, but that capitalism would uh, would win out, you know, and it's exactly what happened. And uh, so, did you talk about in those days things like um, rights for partners, or was no, that no, sort of thing it, even it even was, imagined? It, well, the, the oh, the next phase after after the first phase of the political phase, the Gay Liberation Front, in 1974, we were all exhausted. You know, when the war ended and everything, it was sort of a relief, and also went in sort of a lapse. And um, the next thing that came along that, that caused the organization was fair housing. And that, the, the group that was formed to meet that challenge was called Austin Lesbian Gay Political Caucus. And uh, it, it was, that was the, be be uh, the beginning of another phenomenon in which, it, you know, I would, it, I would probably get a lot of uh, pushback on this, but. Gay men be, began deferring to, well, the women had left, the, the, the women left, the lesbians left Gay Liberation Front and went in with the women's movement because they said, you're men. <laughs> you may be gay, but you're still men, <laughs> and we are oppressed, and you're oppressing us. So I left, right? And then uh, uh, they came back a couple of years later, and they wanted to run everything, you know? And uh, I, I was... Uh, that was sort of when I bowed, bowed out of the, of the political organization uh, this stuff. Uh, but what the, the phenomenon, the way that it worked was that there were some very rich gay men in town, and they had always played, you know, uh, both sides of the uh, fan, and they would finance these, they financed ALGPC, for instance, and they would always, uh, you know, get a right on woman to run the organization. That became sort of a syndrome. And uh, uh, the fair housing ordinance, 
past. There was, you know, that, that was one of the first, to, first in the country. And then everything again sort of lapsed. There were, uh, there, you know, when um, uh, certain candidates would come up for city council. For instance, we elected Frank Cooksey. The, we did all of his uh, his PR work and mail outs and everything, and he couldn't have he couldn't have won it without our uh, uh, help. And so there would be things like that when we would come together and do uh, actions. But the next uh, political uh, crisis was the AIDS uh, AIDS crisis. The I thought, and I still think, that in the initial stages, gay people behaved badly. They wouldn't close the, the baths. They, you know, kept on using uh, blending of. Uh, civil rights rhetoric and uh, sexual liberation rhetoric when it was obvious that those, <laughs> those two things had come to a, you know, a crossroads at least. And I, I, I really resisted the politicization of the, uh, of the, of the, the epidemic. And my feeling was that it, that, that it was a public health crisis that it should not be politicized. And also, I could understand why uh, straight people were, you know, co uh, calling for quarantine it was these people who were not behaving responsi responsibly. Enough. So I would say, I said those things. Well, I got drummed out of the court. I mean, that was that was the last of my uh, uh, political uh, career. Uh, there were, uh, but the uh, you know the liberationist mode is still it's still going. I mean, I I, I can't fault the people who. Uh, financed the uh, AIDS Society of Austin and uh, these other groups. I mean, they were doing, uh, you know, doing the good work. However, the, uh, the, f uh, the focus uh, became, and it is now, assimilation. All along, the uh, uh, gay uh, assimilation into the straight world, all along there's been from the even before the the, the, the uh, official organizations, there's been a conflict between those who wanted to have a sort of an autonomous gay presence in the world, gay institutions, even you know, uh, uh, I don't think, not think towns or anything like that, but just a, an autonomous gay presence, and then others. And largely, I think, for, for economic reasons, who wanted to move into the mainstream. And the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the mainstream movement prevailed, which has eventuated, of course, in gay families, people adopting and then uh, doing, having surrogate uh, uh, mothers and all that. Uh, and as, as well, the, then, then the, the, the biggie is, and it's, just, it's the same as it's been from the very beginning, and that's transgenderism. The, uh, the, the common, the doc size, this is the, the common, what we think we know, it's, it's Heidi Blanc, you ever, there's a book called Straight, it's a wonderful book, it's, it's, it's very, uh, very, very uh, acute, uses the word doxa for what we think we know. And in the, um, in the thinking that goes with cross-dressing, transgendering, and everything, there is a disappearance of two things. One, the identity of the individual, and two, love. It's all, the, everything is cast in terms of, well, I can have sex here, or I can do sex here, I can do. But the, 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 always, the, the, the dialectic has been between love and sex. And love is lost out. Uh, and maybe uh, I'm talking about in the rhetoric. Uh, I'm sure that all these kids fall in love and you know do silly things and run after one another just like we did. But the the uh, uh, Jimmy Farad and I are two of the old folks who have been saying for years now that uh, there's there's a rush into uh, uh, gender uh, transference that is not is, is ill-considered. 
because people who are 22, uh, 23 years old are making decisions that are going to, you know, uh, affect them the rest of their lives. Uh, I have a friend here who owned many bars and many theaters and everything, and I said, well, what happens when, when these people who go through these uh, gender reassignments, when they can no longer, you know, make themselves up to look like Dolly Parton? You know, she said, well, you know, they, they get old like everybody else, you know, and so th for me, that the uh, you, you that there is a person who oh, I'm doing that again. Trans tr uh, uh, goes from male to female or female to male is not actually changing sex. It's changing the effect. You can have the effect of a woman or the effect of a man from a uh, sex change, but you can't reproduce children. I mean, def definitively, women bear children and men sire children, and so. But anyway, those uh, those conflicts and those uh, uh, sort of crevasses in the thinking and in the uh, process have always been there from the very beginning. The, uh, and it goes all the way. It's not even unique to us. It goes all the way back to Greece. I mean, there was the same. There were the same issues in ancient Greece with mm -hmm. uh, sexual reassignment and all that. Um, the my my view has has been largely conditioned by classical humanism, Western uh, philosophical uh, humanism, and uh, the, uh, I still I stick with that, you know, I, uh, I, I, th I think I understand the, the feminist analysis, but I'm not sure that I agree, <laughs> that I agree the, with, the, with the idea that, any, that either sex is uh, superior or inferior to the other. Each has roles. In, in the old days, they were heavily defined, of course. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, I have tried to maintain, and I tried to do this with, you know, with the, whatever guidance I, pros, prospects I had in relation to the other person, to still keep people in the middle of the road, you know, to see, uh, uh, to look at options that were possible, first of all, and second, to, uh, uh, like I, I was just, when, I mean, Austin was home to more sects that are anathema than any <laughs> any comparable uh, square of land on earth. I mean, there were, I mean, you, really, every, under every rock there was another sect, you know, preaching some. And I always hung on to the uh, American Constitution, the scientific method, and the Southern Gentry. <laughs> those were those were my three. I wouldn't let go of the, any of those uh, three. Uh, 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 Principal uh, uh, parts of my uh, upbringing, actually, and uh, but the let's see now. We we covered the theater, mm -hmm. some of the social. So what? Yeah, some of the social. I was wondering where did gay people go in the late sixties, early seventies? Where I mean, were they gathering? Were there yeah, bars? Bars. Well, that see that was one of the. Um, <coughs> Uh, there were some people, I'm, I'm among them, uh, who couldn't take the cigarette smoke. I mean, it was just, you know, the cigarette smoke in the bar was... Uh, so Do you remember when, the names of the places? Uh, well, you know, very, very well. Down, downtown, when I first came here in 65, there were two uh, uh, bars. One was called the Manhattan Lounge, and it was down in Congress between 7th and 8th, and it was a restaurant Manhattan deli, style deli, until about 9, 9.30 at night, and then the, all those people would leave, and the gay people would congregate into the, in the back. Now, this had been going on for a long time. This is 10 or 20 years that that, that, that was going on. And then uh, there was so a that had started in the 50s. I think the, what it is, the late, in the late, 50, the, the late 40s, after World War II, all of these men from all over the country were thrown together, and out of that, and this is not this is not by by any by a long shot a universal opinion, but out of that mixture and that association rubbing up against one another, came the first sort of consensus reality. Hey, well, you know, hey, there's a whole lot more. I'm not by myself, you know. I may be from Joplin, Missouri, or Hope, Arkansas. You know, and there may be one or two of us there, and they may hang out at the Shishan Parlor, and you know. Well, less uh, this one or that one, but all of a sudden, all these these people who who were not uh, freaks, 
they were soldiers, were together, and they brought that back then to uh, uh, with them out of World War II. And San Francisco was the principal uh, uh, magnet because they, a lot of them had shipped out of there, and they had loved California, of course. Uh, you know, it was California. And then the same thing here. There was it was a smaller scene, of course, but the Manhattan Lounge was. Uh, you could meet ancient gay people in there. I did, you know. And there was a, there was a bartender. It was like a cliche, some like almost like La Caja Full. There was a bartender who was, you know, when the straight people were there, he was one way. When the gay people were there, he was another. You know, with his towel and I forgot what his name was. And then there was a a, um, uh, a bar called a Carousel, and it was it's it was in the what is now the Ruth's Chris Steakhouse across from Pootsville uh, uh, Co-op, and it was really a gay bar. I mean, it was the first it was the first gay bar that I was ever in, uh, but it had this uh, very typical uh, uh, frieze of sort of figures in angst, you know, posed these sort of gaunt. Uh, uh, androgynous figures, a long wall of it, and then just a bar, a jukebox, and all that. Uh, but... And that was on 6th Street? No, that's on, uh, uh, that's on, um, uh, Lamar. You know, oh, the, Lamar, okay. Woody Hill, I mean, we still co-op is at 29th, right, 30th and Lamar, and the, okay. uh, there's a, the first Ruth's Chris, I never can say that, Chris Steakhouse, is right is in the old carousel. I see. And it, it was the kind of place though that people would you just you would see people who were entering, you know, they'd be slinking along the wall, you know. It was things just weren't out in the open, you know. Principally, however, the gay people went to one another's houses. They entertained one another a lot. It was considered bad form to be seen at the bar uh, more than once a week, you know. And, uh, and then everybody would go after dinner, and uh, it was dinner parties, and uh, then there was a, um, but there was a, a big huge dance hall down in uh, San Antonio called the, I keep saying the Austin Country, there was a bar later called the Austin Country, actually it's the San Antonio Country. It was huge, it was like a, a old skating rink or something. <laughs> It, it, it catered to all the uh, military people and all those bases around San Antonio. And the MPs would come in, uh, you know, checking because it was off, off, off limits to be there. And the guy in the front of the, in the little ante room had a switch. And he, when they would come in, he would switch it. The lights would, you know, flicker in the uh, ballroom. And that was the, the signal to, for the boys to stop dancing with the boys and the girls to stop dancing with the girls. And they, I have literally seen little chubby dogs dancing with little skinny, skinny gay boys you know, until the MPs left. When the MPs left, they would flick the lights again and everybody would go back to being uh, queers. That's <laughs> amazing. Would they have been arrested and were they arrested? There were people called out of there. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, you know, the, uh, uh, one of the, uh, things that <clears throat> when you came out uh, and you started an active life in the gay world, you sort of took it for granted that you might get busted just for doing, you know, in California you, they, they, uh, you had to have on a certain uh, uh, number of uh, uh, sex appropriate clothes. If you had on more than three uh, uh, women's garments, you could arrest you, you know, the, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and, and, and there was also uh, there was a thrill to it. I mean, it was like uh, it was like going to a speakeasy. You know, Joe sent me, and there was a, you know, there was, and there was also a camaraderie. Uh, uh, you know, we, were, we we knew that what we were doing was illegal, and that we were illegal, and so there was. Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't. Say, yes, I mean, so gay, gay people took care of one another. You know. In relation to those circumstances, I mean, because everybody knew that that's a possibility that you could get beat up or go to jail or whatever. Did the Manhattan Club and the Carousel get raided, and were people arrested no. there? No. It's a curious uh, thing um, about that because I don't even remember the police ever coming into those places after uh, the the. 
uh, the carousel turned, Manhattan Lounge closed. It just, you know, ran out of gas. I mean, finally, it was just, you know, it was just over. And <clears throat> another bar opened at 17th and uh, La Vaca called Pearl Street Warehouse, and it became world famous. It's just a little garage that they, it turned into a gay bar with a jukebox. In the the what street? The Pearl Street Pearl Warehouse. Pearl Street Warehouse. Okay. Now, there is, there was always the contention amongst the conoscenti there that the Pearl Street Warehouse was the one of the only bars in town that was run by the Mafia. And uh, I think that was probably true. The, uh, there was the, the, the woman who uh, was the manager was very mysterious, uh, big, very large woman, <clears throat> and uh, nobody ever knew where, any, I mean, where that money, where the money to organize it and where the money went. It made a lot of money. It just, you know, it was full uh, every night of the week. And uh, 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 and then the carousel uh, closed, and another bar at 29th and uh, and R right in that area called the apartment up, and that was called the Wrinkle Bar. It was for older people. <laughs> the Wrinkle Bar. At 29th and what? <laughs> and, uh, uh, 29th and Lamar, right, right close to Conan, Conan's Pizza in the next block. And that lasted for a long time. Uh, but the, you see, once the, the, once the gay liberation thing had come down the pike and all this other social uh, organization and activity had happened, the, there, was a, there was an urge to move out of the bars, even though people went. Uh, every week, you know, uh, especially on Friday and Saturday night, probably Sunday, uh, the, the the culture just changed, and uh, but the the uh, none of us counted on the next age group, and they were a bunch of bouncing baby boys. I mean, they really were. They're the, what I call the blue boy uh, uh, faction. They arrived and. Uh, whereas we had been sort of long-haired, long-limbed, you know, thin fashion plates, they were, you know, little muscle boys. I mean, literally. I mean, it's, it's very strange. But ten years after all this, they were, and they were all determined they were going to be rich and, uh, uh, you know, and not live. They had learned the the lessons of gay liberation, and they applied them to their careerism. And, and about what? Years, would you that say would be this the, the that, that's about around 80, 1980, just before the AIDS. Uh, that's the AIDS, that's the group that the AIDS phenomenon just really smacked, because they were young and you know wild and and everything. But uh, and so and my uh, that's sort of the end of my tracking of the because for fifteen years, you know there. Uh, it was either someone dead, diagnosed, or dying in my life. And so the, that took up all, you know, practically all of my energy, not just the extra energy, but I, you know, I, especially when there was a close friend was dying, it was important to, uh, uh, you know, to minister to, those, to that process as well as possible. And uh, so the, 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 the uh, the liberation movement is from say 71, no, 69 to 80. I would say that's those those are the uh, the years where the you know where it looked like gay people were going to come into their own. Uh, the artists were going to you know make it. Uh, the you know, dress designers were going to become famous and all that, and then it, they just were wiped out. Uh, most of the people that I knew in New York were very accomplished artists, and and we uh, expected to be the next group, you know, on the cover of Time magazine, and it just didn't happen, you know. And so that uh, the the political organizations that grew out of the epidemic, I didn't agree with. I, I didn't agree with their uh, with their strategies and their uh, you know philosophies and everything, and so I just. You know, I retreated into my own private, uh, private existence. Uh, 
There was a group at one time called Gay People of Austin. That was an earlier group, wasn't it? Gosh, I've never, that's one I've uh, You're never familiar heard. familiar with that one? Okay. Yeah. All right. What, what year would that have been? I think mid-70s. Uh, well, see, that's, that's, when the, that's when everything breaks apart. Mm. Uh, one of the, at that point, uh, one of the things that we did, well, there's the men's movement that comes along, but that's a little bit later in the mid-80s, early 80s to mid-80s. But uh, we, uh, we had, uh, uh, meet, there was a group uh, who started uh, sessions for Vietnam vets, and that went on for a long time. Uh, uh, where they would just come and, you know, unload, basically. But, uh, uh, and now, there are, there's a, you know, there's a, a gay organization practically under every rock. Uh, right. You know, I, 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 I don't know, uh, don't really know much about it. You know, I was at a, uh, at a, taping uh, last week and I met a bunch of kids that I liked a lot and they had seemed to have a lot to say and they seemed to be very aware. Uh, but the, uh, there's a, the, the whole thing is, is happening all over again the way that it uh, happened before. Gay boys just are not going to become feminists. I mean they're much too involved with maleness and there's no, there's no uh, nexus. There's no need for them to, uh, you know, to do that. And the the the, the political movement is very feminist. The, the you know it's a uh, it's there are a lot of very strong women, and uh, uh, like everything else in the country, they are they're in leadership uh, positions more and more. And the and there's a it seems to me there's been, there's a backlash against gay men that the uh, that the AIDS phenomenon is part of, I and mean, we're still suffering from prejudice uh, in relation to that, I think. Um, the, but, but more significantly, they have, it's like well, when, you, when you go to a party of these, this, these groups that I'm talking about, it's like going back to the 50s. It even looks like the 50s. The haircuts, the clothes, and everything are very much uh, main, you know, Ivy League uh, type stuff. The but there is a uh, uh, there's a need in the in the uh, the whole uh, uh, community for I hate that word but that's what it is in some way or the other uh, for an explain explanation to them of their history. How did you get to be, you know, a boy that goes to a uh, a, a gay bar and picks up another uh, a boy and uh, uh, you know goes home and you uh, you live in a, a two hundred fifty thousand dollar condo uh, and you work at uh, a technological uh, firm and and you and you have every prospect of making a million dollars before uh, before how do, how does your how does this history that we're talking about have anything to do with you I don't think they think it does. Uh, the girls, the women, seem to be a little more conscious of the fact that that, that something precedes them. You know? mm -hmm. um, so going back in time, um, there was at one time when UT wouldn't allow gay groups on campus, right. wasn't there a settlement between was it the Gay Liberation Front and UT? Eventually, the court uh, ordered UT to allow uh, the liber Gay Liberation on campus, the, and, that, and there was a and there was a for years the, there was a, a meeting on campus, a Gay Liberation meeting. Would that be a state court or county court? Do you I'm know? I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I think it must have been. I think it was. I don't know. I don't know what, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it was court ordered that finally the that was settled by the court. I see. The uh, uh, and you know, I can't even remember who the lawyers were. I know they were gay, uh, they were gay lawyers. Uh, but uh, as I say, I sort of lost interest in the 
I mean, I, I was peripherally interested, but uh, two years into the liberation front, I was moving on into something to do with art, probably. Mm -hmm. that's, my, that's my main focus, and it always has been. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, there was a, as I understand it, a raid on a dance at UT at one time. Oh, gosh. Um, the fun, there was a fundraising dance, and the police showed up. Are you hmm. familiar with this story? But this I mean, is probably vaguely, the kind it's probably, of... It's later. I think it's later in the, you know, in the, in the process. Maybe not. You know, I wasn't... <laughs> I used to think that I was everywhere at, at all times, but there are things that I don't remember and things that I didn't uh, uh, participate in, you know. Uh, mm. But that is the kind of history that you're talking about that younger gay men are not aware of. Right. They don't know, the, they don't think that, it seems to me, I, I can't say this authoritatively, but it seems to me that they don't know or respect the, uh, the what it took for them to be able to live freely. You know, it took a lot, there was a lot of, it wasn't like the civil rights movement, there wasn't that kind of, you know, epic suffering that went, uh, along with that, and uh, because we weren't slaves, you know, I mean, we weren't coming out of slavery, we were coming out of a different uh, uh, nexus entirely, and also most of us were white. And so, <clears throat> the, uh, that meant that that wasn't a particular cr crisis, uh, and, and it still isn't, you know, qu quite frankly. There's, there's very little way that you can, you can make a, a prosperous uh, gay man uh, Experience the kind of oppression that we're talking, you know, that we're talking about being busted and you know, losing your job, and you know, and, and, and if you in the in the old days, if you got uh, caught in a you know compromising situation, you you lost your job. There was no way for you to make a living. You became really an outcast, you know. And those um, uh, the, the, when the when when the political movements succeeded. That, it's just like with any, it's like, you know, second generation of a wealthy family. They don't know where the money comes from, they spend it like water, and the third generation saves what they can, you know. The, uh, and uh, I was at a <clears throat> birthday party several weeks ago, and this kid is just a kid, I keep saying that, a young man had just gotten back from New York, and the stories that he was telling me was just like it was before the AIDS epidemic. And, uh, I, you know, the... Uh, or very before it, before AIDS came down the pipe, it was my contention that gay people could not continue living the way that they're. I mean, you can't start partying on Thursday night and stop on Tuesday. You know, in, the, in New York, California, not here to a certain extent, and it was all drug driven. You know, not not uh, psychedelic drugs either. You know, not the hard drugs, heavy drugs, and so the. I, I don't know what the the bacchanalian uh, impulse is exactly. Uh, uh, but there is one in the gay male scene, and the, you know, the gay women have been for for years, my friends, talking behind our back. You know, <laughs> just you know, horrified at the things that they would hear us talk about as normative reality. You know, and you do get sort of um, uh, inured to uh, to uh, the outrageous and the flamboyant uh, aspects. The Were there certain particular things that you consider pivotal uh, victories, if you will? For instance, the fair housing. The fair housing, you mean in Austin? Yes. Hmm. Well, uh, Again, the fair what's the fair housing and you know jobs and all that? It was so easy to live here that the uh, uh, there's there there just you know I, I just can't think of you know, as we said the fair housing AIDS uh, I can't think of any crisis uh, that. Uh, that's 
that became a part of the general welfare, you know, it became a crisis for the general welfare. Uh, however, there is a, a there is a in uh, in about 1983, 85, the, a, a gay bank opened. United Bank was owned by a a guy named Reuben Johnson. And eventually he went to jail for embezzlement and uh, cheating his uh, partners and all this kind of stuff. And it pointed out to me the perils of, uh, of, of that kind of careerism. I mean, the man started as a, he was a nurse for someone, it was a rich, fabulously rich person, and got the money somehow. And the for me, the, the, the Reuben Johnson affair is emblematic of a kind of amorality in the, in the it's part of the, 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 the larger culture too, but um, the gay, gay men don't have children. They don't have uh, a lot of financial responsibility except to themselves and their lifestyle. So once they get beyond a certain, uh, you know, uh, level, it's oh, the money that they have is extra, and they have and they can spend it on themselves. <coughs> there, there's a, a group called the the circuit, and they just go from they just fly from Paris to you know, Borneo to wherever to party, and then you take these cruises, all these gay cruises. You see it in the magazines, and all of the magazines, the gay magazine, the Advocate, Out. They're very up, upscale. It's almost as if there are no more poor or needy uh, gay people in the world in these in these uh, uh, these syntheses. And so, uh, the for me the 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 but see th this is another thing. Oddly, it, oddly enough, in my life, I have really experienced very little personal oppression. My family, uh, they, they weren't, you know, liberal about it, they, but they tolerated uh, the eccentricity that I manifested very early on. Same thing in high school and in college. I just didn't go through the kind of uh, crises that a, a lot of people do. However, I would say that gay prisoners, uh, uh, gay boys and girls from the underclass, uh, abused uh, gay children, uh, and, and several other issues like that, health uh, provision, uh, are part of the, the gay responsibility that is not being addressed. The, the, um, the, some parts of the movement, and, and it is part of the movement, I've been thinking about this a lot because I was thinking about what I was going to say. Uh, after I realized we were going to do this interview, uh, <clears throat> even though uh, there is a country club aspect to the gay movement, it's still part of the gay movement. They still see themselves, and they still act. I mean, the the uh, the the richest gay people in town provide money for all of these little organizations and things. You know, like Gay Pride, uh, uh, of course. So, as uh, AIDS Society of Austin is a, you know, it's a big, uh, big concern, and uh, and there, uh, there are other, uh, other projects too. Of course, my mind uh, that uh, drops them right now. But so, the 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 uh, the, the strat the strategy and tactics. Of the movement had changed, even though it's it's upscale. It is still involved with some of these issues, civil rights. <clears throat> now that brings up another one of my pet noirs, and that's gay marriage. But I I don't. I first of all, let me issue a caveat. I think you're supposed to do whatever you want to do in your, in your life. I'm not here to tell you not to get married or to get married or anything like that. But the um, uh, the effort to assimilate into the American middle class and upper classes 
as gay couples somehow doesn't uh, meet uh, the, my criteria of struggle in, in relation to, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not something that I think is a, uh, uh, it's not crucial to survival, it's not, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's almost not gay. <laughs> if you want to get married and have children, then that is, even though you're a same-sex couple, the the there there's some, there is something there's there's some sort of contradiction there for me. I just uh, I haven't worked it, and I, you know this is not a popular uh, a position to take, but uh, that's not anything new for me. But the um, as it's there are two, two things that stick with me in this current moment, and that's transgenderism, as I said before, and the. Uh, uh, and, and, and same-sex marriage. It seems to me that both are, both are emblematic of disaffection, of self, of something. Because see, I don't think that the state, this is a, this is a, this is a, a spiritual, religious belief, I don't think the state can sanctify, uh, or the church, a marriage between two same-sex people, given the, the uh, record, the horrific record of the church and the state in its relation to gay people, what they've done, you know, it's just so that the, the love that two people have for, of the same sex have for one another is the marriage, and I've always thought that this is not something new. The 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 certification is something else. That's another. That's a legal matter. It has to do with property and uh, health insurance, all those things that people need. And I and I'm not. Uh, it's not my place to deny that those things are real and that they should be able to to access those kinds of things through legal um, uh, marriage. However, the, I think there needs to be, for perfect, to be perfectly honest, I would be have been satisfied with civil unions, you know, uh, or a, a process whereby you can, uh, could will, you know, yourself, your, Goods to and your uh, your money to uh, to a same-sex partner without any you know, fear of you know the, that being superseded in some way, uh, and uh, uh, domestic partner benefits, all those things. I think I'm, I'm, I'm for all that. I just don't see the uh, the necessity, and also it's caused such a political firestorm. The uh, I think it's made the the Democrats extremely vulnerable on several, you know, I think if it hadn't been for the, for, for the gay marriage issue, I don't think George Bush would have been elected president. Uh, and uh, because, you know, the, I think there was a, 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 issue, a referendum on the ballot in Ohio the last time, and it turned out all of the uh, huge right wing. Now, there are people who say, well, you know, we can't wait for the right moment, and the right moment is always now in relation, and that's true. Uh, but I'm I'm just not sure of the the purpose, you know, of uh, and, and the it, same. I have known the children of more uh, lesbians that I've uh, of gay men. Uh, that that's just natural, I think, because women uh, the children stay with their mothers, and I've known several women who have children. I've not been around. Uh, Many uh, children of gay, two gay men. So I can't say anything. I don't know anything about any of that. It's just that philosophically and politically, I, I struggle with uh, uh, with with that. Um, Can I ask you about your book? Which book? Oh, you have one. Well, I know that. <laughs> no, I was going to ask yeah. you about um, ask, ask the, the fire. fire. Okay. Well. Um, it is about this guy, James Osborne Denny, who was one of the founders of Gay Liberation. He was, uh, he spoke and wrote seven languages, Arabic, Hebrew, Italian, French, Spanish, Latin, and German. And uh, he, he was a, 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 a true genius. I mean, he, uh, uh, he, he got his uh, master's in linguistics from UT, his BA was from Rice, and then he went to A&M 
to uh, study um, grapes and olives <laughs> because he believed that the world was going to be reduced to having to make do with less and goats and grapes and uh, uh, form the basis of the Mediterranean cultures and that and so he wanted to know how to grow grapes and olives gra grapes cheese uh, and olives uh, became his uh, it, it really it's kind of an obsession okay in the in the course of his uh, time in school, he went and lived in Morocco and traveled all over the Middle East. And he ended up uh, as a gardener for the king of Saudi Arabia for grapes and olives after getting his PhD from A&M from and all of that. There's only one problem with it all. <laughs> he was a spy. I, I, in the novel, uh, I made this, of course, I, this, is, I'm, this is my creation, but he's a double agent. At the very, very high end, he was uh, uh, in school at Rice with, and this is the novel, he was in school at Rice with uh, this woman named Sabine Horvath, and she's a multi billionaires with an art collection, a friend of the president and all that. So there's this big, huge cocktail party to which he's invited as her guest. And that trips this whole plot. In the... Um, so to clarify, this person that the book is based on uh -huh. was a, a real person. A real person. Who did in fact get his PhD in olives and he's grapes. Great. <laughs> and was the, the royal gardener for the king of Saudi Arabia. But was not in fact a spy? Well there, there, there were people who, was, who, would, who would you know question my what I had to say about it. But there, uh, when he finished uh, A&M he applied to USIA, United States Information Service, in uh, Nicaragua. There was wars were still going on down there in El Salvador and uh, Guatemala and Nicaragua. And the uh, FBI came through town asking questions about him. And the, the, one of the persons that he had given as a reference, when he was asked, if Jim was involved in drugs, as far as the guy knew, the guy said, well, uh, he smokes a little marijuana. But that's, well, that was, you know, he didn't get the job. And uh, about, about six months later, he was in Nicaragua. What I think happened is that the, the uh, when he, when he disqualified, he was disqualified from getting the, the first job, that gave the, uh, powers that be the CIA, I think, an opening so, so that they could approach him. And since he was uh, fluent in all those languages, in all the languages that they needed, I think he became uh, a CIA agent. However, his political sensibilities and everything lay with the uh, Arabs, as do mine. And uh, the he would make these sort of mysterious forays into Egypt and uh, Palestine, <clears throat> and nobody ever knew why or what he was doing. He never said much about it. I think that he was involved in the in the uh, 1993 World Trade Center bombing somehow or the other. Uh, and after after all of this, he came back, and this is all in the book. Came back to this country and was the legislative aide to the chairman of the House Committee on Agriculture in California. And while he, you know, the first year that he was there, he disappeared for three days. No, it was longer than that. Anyway, he disappeared and, <clears throat> and they didn't know where he was. And he was found wandering around the streets of uh, Washington, having been dosed with a, uh, 
something. And it, as it turned out, uh, he died of, of flesh-eating bacteria. He was one of the first, second person in this country to die of that, you know, that thing that, anyway. So I made up an entire novel uh, around that. And uh, in this, in the, uh, uh, in the process of writing the novel, I realized, oh, I bet you he could have run into some of the people uh, that bombed the World Trade Center. And so they, in the, he dies on the day of the, of 9-11. He's watching it on TV and it just maxes him out. Okay, that's the skeleton. But there's also a huge, uh, uh, there's a long essay on the Knights Templar. Uh, because when he was in, uh, when Jim was in uh, Jerusalem, I don't remember the, uh, I mean, he, he was an esotericist and quite frankly, a lot of the stuff that he uh, sort of promulgated was beyond me. I didn't know what he was talking about a lot, you know, because there's a lot of esotericism and that he could connect up with scientific uh, research and all that. But anyway, he, in the novel, he finds the uh, Al-Qaeda uh, uh, plotters, but actually the, they know where they are anyway, and they did. The, uh, the uh, uh, Bush administration knew where the Al-Qaeda people were. They had they had accepted recept, intercepted all of their phone uh, messages from uh, uh, the Middle East, and they were living in a hotel right down from the National Security Agency. This is all I didn't make this up. Any, anyway, it's all I've woven this whole thing uh, into this. It's a difficult novel. It's not easy to read. I was looking at some comments, so I could tell there were probably little gay boys that were making, oh, it sounds like he's just trying to be, he's just being, he's just, you know, uh, showing off, that kind of, that kind of stuff, you know. It, it's a difficult, it's a difficult novel. I have another one that, that's being published, uh, well, as soon as we, I'm starting the editing process next month, it'll be published this fall, and it's a lot easier. But it's a continu, it, there's, there's three novels, it's called The Fire Trilogy, this one is called After the Fire, and then the third one is called The Fire. And this is kind of, the first one is a more, it's kind of an academic, it's not dry, but you have to, you have to work to understand what's going on in it. Uh, this one is like a, a movie. <laughs> it's like, uh, I decided that I wanted to sell this. Then I, uh, and then the, the third one, The Fire, is, 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 uh, is very poetic. As I, it's going off in my head now, and it's got to be my sort of Moby Dick, as it were. Uh, or there's a wonderful uh, novel by a, a lesbian writer named Juna Barnes called Nightwood, and it's you know it's probably the greatest poetic novel in English of the 20th century. It's very short, and I've always wanted to uh, to write like that, and so. In this novel, I'm including a novel within a novel, and it's going to be this poetic uh, novel. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, someone asked me uh, why I write, and he said, is it for an audience? I said, no. Is it for other people? No. Uh, I said, in a difficult way, it's for God. I don't believe in God, but that's, that's the cor correct answer. I'm writing for the ages. You know, I mean, I uh, I would love to be able to write a bestseller, and uh, you, one writes as he, as one can. You know, I can't uh, tailor my uh, style to the current best-selling uh, moda, moda. You know, I mean, I just can't do it. And so, but I hope that the uh, that this second one, after the fire, which is it's called, kind of it's I think it was an interlude between the first and the second will break that, because uh, I wrote it, it has six murders, and uh, uh, lots of heterosexual uh, sex, what else, uh, six murders, and uh, uh, and so the, it's a sensational, it's sensational, but... Uh, you write poetry also, don't you? That's what I am as a poet, basically. Oh. I learned to do all this other stuff because People uh, said, well, you know, you can't make a living as a poet. So I said, well, I'll learn to write plays. Well, didn't, you know, have, that hasn't dominoed either. And uh, I've always, 
I've always had this vocation to, to write the novels. And I've had to learn the, 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 the uh, um, this novel, the, the editing process of this first novel taught me more than I ever knew about the, uh, the construction of prose. But uh, I sort of have, when I was uh, three years old, my father had gone to World War II and we were living in the country in Arkansas with my grandparents. <clears throat> and in the summer, in the afternoon, late afternoon, they would get on the front porch and usually cut a watermelon or a cantaloupe and sit rest from the day, you know. Well, this was this old, old Arkansas cabin. It had four rooms and a big, wide front porch. I would get under the porch, the front porch, and begin, I can remember doing this, uh, free associating, just telling all that I was making stories up out of what I had heard on the radio from my from, from everybody talking about. And I made up this whole elaborate uh, story about my wife and I, and my wife's name was Katie. And they would sit on, they would sit, I was be under the porch, they'd be on the top of the porch. And I'd be down there talking, you know, telling myself, you know, telling this story like that. And they would say, well, how's Katie doing? And I'd say, oh, she's, <laughs> she's fine. And I had two children, two sons, and they were in the war. And I made up all this, up, and I've always done that. That's always, it's just part of my, uh, uh, it's part of my nature. However, uh, you, you, one has to learn a style. Everybody says, oh, I've got a book you need, to, you know, I can, I can write a book, you need to write a book about me. Well, that's true. But there has to be, in a, in a, when you write a novel, there has to be a reason for writing the novel. And it has, to, it has to be subtle and not obvious, but it has to be there. You have to, the, the, the reader has to know that this, is, uh, that this is something that is being told to him. You know, this is a, and it, it, every novel, every story, every play, every movie has an arc. You know, and uh, the there is no formula for it. You know, every story has a kind of, has a life of its own. So, uh, my uh, uh, my novels coming as late as they do are really um, b benefit from all of my from a lifetime of education. Even though I've been writing, I wrote my first novel when I was twenty five. But, do you uh, work with an editor? I do. Okay. Uh -huh. he, uh, he, he is very practical and uh, he knows the, you know, the ins and outs of putting a sentence, a paragraph of, you know, all that together. I do too, but in a different way. I come, come at it from a different perspective. And he sort of trims my sails. I mean, because I have a tendency to poeticize. Uh, and uh, that can be most of the time, it, it, it can be, look wonderful, and you'll keep it in there for two years, and then all of a sudden you'll see it, and it's just dead wood. You know, you realize this just doesn't, you can't do this. You know? And he's been very good for that. Uh, for, who is he? His name is Toby Johnson. Uh, he's a he's a, a man, of, a person of means, who uh, works with a, a, a gay publishing house, and. Uh, uh, very good. I, uh, uh, is that who's going to be publishing your? Th this, textbook? this, yes. Th uh, they're going to publish it, but I, we're not. I'm not working. I'm not going to work it the same way as I worked the uh, um, this last one. I, I mean, um, I, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to do different marketing. What's the name of the publisher? Lethe Press. L e t h e. It's a Maple Shade, New Jersey. It's a. It's, it's a large concern, but they don't have any. Um, budget for marketing and all that, but it, it, when I when I started, oh, I want to say you know that uh, as we as we're talking about my uh, career now in relation to gay history, my careers have a lot to do with Austin gay history, and not just Austin gay history, the the, the national uh, process. Uh, for instance, the, my first play was done at uh, 330 Grove Street in uh, San Francisco. And the night of the first rehearsal in this gay community center that was the rival to Harvey Milk, 
George Moscone and Harvey Milt were killed that day. So uh, that play became uh, uh, just part of that scene, that whole gestalt. Uh, and then here, my... Uh, What's the title of that play? Diocletian and Sebastian. The Emperor Diocletian and his lover Sebastian, whom he executed, shot full of arrows and all that. And then the, uh, my uh, first play here in Austin was the, uh, called The Quail in the Pines. It was produced in the Paramount. And it was the first, I, I think it was the first gay play produced in Texas at that level. There may have been you know, other things, in, but the Paramount Theater was a you know, pretty good place to start out. And in fact, it was. It would have been better if I hadn't started there. When you start at the top, it's you know, it's a long fall. But uh, I think that was the first uh, gay play produced in, and that was the first in Austin. Even though Ken Johnson, when he realized I was doing that, pulled one of his plays out and you know, got it up on stage at the Hyde Park Theater before we opened. But it was the first. What year was that? Uh, 1983. 83. And then the second play uh, was very topical. It, it was about a murder in Houston. It was based on a murder in Houston. Michelle Yarshi, the, uh, the uh, late uh, uh, producer at the Capital City Playhouse, thought it was one of the best plays he'd ever produced, and the best uh, new play that he had produced. But it was a, you know, it was really a radical, uh, violent uh, murder play. And the it's called uh, Last Night at Mary's. And uh, then the third play was uh, uh, about a, a porn star who was trying to go straight, to make it as a, mod a straight model in the world. And uh, it's very popular. It, uh, had, it was uh, restaged twice after it opened at uh, Capital City Playhouse. But all this was way out front of, the, of, of 1983. And I, I got a lot of flack for it too. I mean, uh, you know, the uh, the Chronicle and I still are not over it. The Chronicle uh, um, sent a reviewer to the play. She didn't see the play, but she wrote the review anyway, which did not go well. And she called me a sexist uh, in print to uh, to boot because the woman in the play was not a liberated woman. She was, you know, a, a bit less than, than liberated. So all these things, you know, were, uh, they were early to the, uh, uh, th these political scenes and social scenes and uh, artistic scenes with Doug Dyer, those all thing, those things that all happened. But I was the, uh, the next uh, person that did things that were highly visible publicly in town. Did you work with Doug Dyer? You know, I never did. We, he was the first person to take me to New York, though, uh, to write a play for Joseph Papp, not Diocletian and Sebastian, which eventually I did uh, on my own, I almost killed myself out in California. But uh, uh, I went to New York uh, with Doug and wrote the play in his loft. And uh, uh, as I say, uh, you know, cocaine was, uh, he was doing a lot of cocaine. Uh, 